tonight. Do you want to be embarrassed? Download your entire search history. Samsung's new theme engine might be sexist. An attention technology addict. The doctor will see you now. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 320 for Monday, April 20th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code TN2 when you check out. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney. This is the show where we cover the top tech headlines and talk to an expert behind the headlines. Now let's get to today's big news. The Apple Watch is supposed to arrive for some this Friday, April 24th. As Mike Elgin reported earlier on Tech News Today, charges for the Apple Watch have begun to appear on the credit cards and debit cards of people who have ordered the watch online. Here to talk to us about the Apple Watch and a few other issues at the intersection of technology and psychotherapy is Georgia Dow, senior editor at iMore and host of the VectorCast, ReviewsCast, and the Isometric Show. Welcome, Georgia. Hi, Megan. It's great to have you. I love seeing you on MacBreak Weekly and love your other podcasts too. So thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you. So you ordered an Apple Watch. What's your I delivery did. date? I'm really lucky. My delivery date is April 24th, though that'll probably mean closer to, um, you know, the next week. But I'm I'm hopeful that I'll get it on April 24th. But I I know that that probably will not be the case. It'll probably be a week later. So you stayed up late to order it, or did you have a drone working for you? <laughs> I actually, I, I did the full, I fully geeked out. I had my alarm wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, and I was doing a keynote the next day as well. So I, you know, I woke up, then I had to drive for six hours just so I could get the watch as soon as possible. Um, and and so, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people. <laughs> So you're also a licensed psych psychotherapist. Um, so I wanted to ask your opinion on some things. What do you think the likelihood that Apple Watches will make us be less addicted to our phones? Well, I think that I think that one of the best things about the Apple Watch is the, the its placement. We're going to be able to check out notifications seamlessly without having a, you know this large phone that pretty much dwarfs my face in front of us and stops the flow of conversation. So the nice thing about having something that's on your wrist is that you can glance at it without stopping the flow of conversation, which I think is going to be really nice. On the flip side of it is, you know, everyone's going to know that I have my watch with me and that I chose not to reply to their messages. So I think that there's like that push and pull um, having something on you all the time where people can contact you, I do worry that that might cause a little bit more anxiety. And it also may make people even more addicted to have to check constantly every little buzz, beep, or I guess taptic engine <laughs> that's feeding you information. So the taptic engine is the, just the tap you'll get as a notification on your wrist, right? Right, right. And so that'll be, you'll be able to choose what to turn on and off. I figure most people will probably start with almost everything turned on. So for every call, message, tweet, they're going to be, you know, having that on, which I think is, it's increasing your anxiety levels because you're going to want to constantly look. And so you should probably turn almost everything off except for those that are really important to you. Right. I mean, that's what I have to do for myself. Like now that my kids are starting to have smartphones with notifications, I have to tell them to do it too, because, right. you know, it's just like you can't control and sometimes you can't control your own behavior. You know, you hear the notification, you have to look, but you know, you don't miss anything when you turn off the notifications really. No, I'm really lucky is that I, I actually have nothing on. I don't have any buzzing beeping I get. And I, I usually flip my phone upside down so that I never see it. So that means that when people call me, I usually don't answer because I'm not there or I don't know. But the nice thing is that I, I control my phone, not the other way around. You don't want, you know, your watch or your phone to be something that you are the slave to. That increases anxiety, feeling like I have to answer, that this is now an obligation of mine. And so I control when I'm free. I will check my phone for any messages or notifications that might be there. And my stress levels drop starkly after I did that. And I, I, you just still don't miss anything, right? I check every couple of hours or so, and 
you'll get anything that might be really important. Right. And, you know, we'll still have to have our phones with us if we have an iPhone and the watch, as opposed to Google announced today that you won't even need to have your phone nearby to use your Android Wear as long as there's Wi-Fi. So I, I don't know if there will be any difference with that. Like just not, the idea of like not having your phone with you seems actually frightening to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're kind of, we're attached to them, right? Like there's this anxiety when you don't have your phone, you feel like you're disconnected from the world, from any connection that you may need or any messages that you might get. Um, the nice thing about the watch is that like, you know, when you leave outside of your, like say 30 feet, and so it's it's not getting any of the Bluetooth connection. When you come back to it, you're going to, it's going to get everything downloaded to it. So you don't have to really worry. And, and most of us are probably much closer to our phones than 30 feet for most of the day anyways, which I guess in some ways is a bad thing to say about society at large. Right. So now you're a gamer. Do you think you're going to play games on the Apple Watch? You know, I think that I probably, I will. I will play any game that happens to be on the watch. I think that because of its battery power, it, their games are going to have to be exceptionally simplistic in, in nature so that you don't drain it within the hour, though. I, I will probably test out because I, I run a gaming podcast every game that that comes by that I can download that seems interesting to it. I probably will not enjoy gaming on my watch. It's just too small of a real estate. So I would be interesting to see what kind of games that they can get that would hold my interest and yet still not be frustrating. Right. So what apps are you most excited about? So for me, my, my greatest thing is just notification and getting phone calls and being able to like, you know, use the hue lights and being able to open and close the door on my house. It's really usability that's that's going to be nice so that I don't have to search for my my phone when I'm trying to change the lighting or if I have to suddenly come home or I need to open up the garage for someone that's coming in. So for me, I don't think that it's something that's going to be really fancy. I just love the fact that I'm not going to have to search through my mammoth purse for my phone every time I need to message someone or answer a phone call. So I just want to look like Mission Impossible and be able to like talk to my watch and be able to like message things. That's that's going to be so exciting for me. I've been waiting for the watch forever. <laughs> so I heard you interviewed on the FitCast. It's a great exercise and health podcast. And you and Kevin, the host, both said you hadn't had much success with the fitness wearables that are out there now. You both kind of said you didn't trust them. Their, you know, their data was, he said he drove in a car for, you know, six hours and said he'd run or for, for five miles. So do you think the Apple Watch will be more accurate? Do you think it'll be any different as far as fitness is concerned? I think that it'll be slightly more accurate for sure. Um, just their, their, the, the engines and all of the different sensors that they have, they have many more sensors than in the watch. Plus they're going to have, you know, your use through GPS as well. And then they have the heart rate monitor that's on it. So I think that one is it'll be more accurate Two, I think it's going to be more usable. I, I don't think that the effort that it took me to, to charge, um, you know, each one of the fit, you know, Fitbits or anything else that I tried, it, it was just, I would end up forgetting and it didn't really matter because it was only tracking my fitness. And then once in a while when it would get it wrong, it just made me feel frustrated. So I think that even if, say for fitness, it's not as accurate as, you know, an actual heart rate monitor that you may own at home. If you do, it's the one that's easiest that's on you. And then it also gets all of my notifications and I can answer phone calls and I can listen to music on it as well. So I think that because of that, I think that it's going to be very useful and I, you know, it's going to look nice. I'm going to be able to bling it up as I want. So I'm expecting that I will keep up with my watch in comparison, just because, you know, carrying around a huge phone, it's cumbersome. So being able to have a small watch with you, it makes my life easier. Interesting. So let's do you, move. Do you use one yourself? I, Any of the fit? No, I don't. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I mean, I just have a regular, you know, old dumb watch that I use for running and, you old, know, it doesn't, watch, doesn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so. It just uh, tells the time how, it, how crazy like that. I know. So I'm going to start with the Pebble time. That's going to be my first smartwatch. And then I'm going to see if I, if I really need an Apple watch next. So. We'll see. Right. But you are the first person that I've talked to that is really very excited and has like many defined use cases for it. So that that is interesting. Yeah. But I wanted to move on to kids and technology. You're a gamer, you're a mom, and you're a psychotherapist. So I think you're the perfect person to talk about gaming and kids. Uh, you love video games. So let it tell us how it felt when you started to see your own children be affected by video games. So when I, I would let them play and I noticed that they were slightly more rude, um, quick to temper, had that those just regular addictive tendencies of not wanting to get off, not listening when I had, and that zoned out look. So they look like they're just stuck. There's nothing but them and the television. 
And I had to say to myself after a while that I was noticing them become more rude in interactions with me even after that they were playing. And we had to think, hmm, you know, it's nothing that's changed at home except that we've increased the amount of time that they were allowed to play video games. And so I had to think, I love video games. I think that they're a wonderful, you know, a means of interacting with the world. I don't think that there's something that's horrible, but this is not really benefiting my child in the skills that I want to teach them for life. And so I had to think to myself, there has to be a better way, some sort of a means in between not letting them play at all or, you know, letting them play all day as they want. And so we kind of had to figure out somewhere in between. Right. So I know you're also a jiu-jitsu expert. So was that what you decided? Jiu-jitsu, the iPad out of their hands? Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, we tr we tried not to do that. It, it doesn't work out well, and probably it would break your iPad. But um, what instead we decided to do was a reward system. So when they we we chose what was the most important things in our household for them to practice, which would be manners, um, dealing with emotional regulation, not getting angry, and whenever and also good grades in school, doing their homework and doing a good job with that. And then they would earn points to that. We did it through stickers, but anyone could just do it through points that they earn. And then they could, just like real life, cash them in in order to get to play TV and games um, as they wanted for a certain period of time. And it worked really, really well. Like they chose when they would want to play. Um, they also chose the amount of time that they could play. And they also felt really proud when they started to earn um, their points in order to play the games. And that was the coolest part is that they were there. They had more better manners. They were practicing saying pleases and thank yous and how do you do with things, interacting with people more. And since they didn't play games, they were interacting better with each other. Both of, I have two boys and they were talking with each other, playing with each other. They would, if I'm gardening, they want to garden. Like video games are just so much fun. There's nothing that's going to be able to compete with them besides like very few real life activities like paintball or maybe doing a martial art. But there's very few things that can compete with a video game. So by taking that off the plate, they ended up, you know, wanting to cook with us and learning other skills. And they had their own little plant garden, which they love to interact with. So I thought that it worked out really nicely. So we still do it. It's been now about eight months that we've, uh, since we started, and it's been wonderful. I love this because, I mean, it is really hard as a parent who's also a geek and you love all this stuff and, and you love that they love it, but at the same time, it could just, I mean, it can drive your whole household insane. I think they, you know, and you miss out on all the other things, the reading and the just being together. And, um, you know, and my trouble is, you know, I, I want to use it as a consequence all the time. You know, once right. they started, like we didn't really do TV for a really long time. So once they started video games, it was like, oh, okay, well, you won't get that. But then it was never connected. It was like, oh, you won't brush your teeth and you won't get to play Minecraft. And, you know, we're taught like the consequences should be logical, but it really makes sense because the, the struggle I was having was how they were acting afterwards. So if you teach them right. that they have to learn to act well in order to get that, it was, I really like that, so... Yeah, yeah, it works out nice, and it's a natural consequence. That's the way that the world works. You work hard, and you get money, and with the money, you can buy what you want in life. And so that replicates what you already want them to learn about life, is that hard work gets paid off, and it's a reward instead of a consequence. And that's also like a video game, too, you know, earning that yeah. video games work, right? It's yes, fun. I gamified their life. Yes. <laughs> Well, Georgie has a whole article about that. If you want to, we will link to that in our show notes that explains exactly how she did that. And um, it's great. I highly recommend it. Um, and another question about kids. And last week I found myself telling my kids to say please and thank you when they were talking to Siri. And I just thought, oh, am I going crazy? Or, you know, as, as technology becomes more human, does it make sense to start treating it in more humane ways? Or is that just confusing kids? I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a good habit for children to have when they're interacting with anything. If you had them not have to do it just because it's a computer, then they may not be learning that habit of when they ask for something, they say please and thank you. So I do the same thing. They should be polite with whatever it might be that they are interacting with, whether someone's on the phone, someone's in real life, or even a computer. Not because I care what Siri thinks, how my children are behaving, but because I want them just to get into that good habit of always having good manners because when they would be stressed or angry or upset, the manners kind of go out the window. So it's good for them to practice that habituation all the time. Right. I know it's a bizarre question and I appreciate it. No, it's, it's absolutely, I think it's a really good question because computers are becoming more and more human. Our, our ability to be able to tell the difference is slowly going to melt away. 
But in the end, it's not about the computer. It's about your child's natural habits with what they interact with. And I think that they should be polite with what they handle and and whether it be the computer or another person, they should always treat it with respect. Right. And I know Siri has some built in features that will tell kids. I've heard, you know, that might my son was looking for something that actually wasn't rude, although I'm sure he has searched for rude <laughs> stuff, but I think she misunderstood him and she said, you know, I'm blushing. And so she will sort of, she already has some of those built in. She has a little bit of self-respect. That's good. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and she could take over some of our parenting duties. See, sometimes she'll do a better job sometimes. Yeah. So uh, today I posted on Twitter that you were coming uh, and I asked people to send in questions. I got one really good one that could probably take us for another half hour, but uh we were asked, how can you un- realize you have an unhealthy computer addiction and what are some ways to resolve it? So this is, I assume, for adults, not for kids. Right. It's a great question. And we'll just I'll just use the rules that I have for addiction in general, not just for computers. If ever you say to yourself that I have to do something, I have to go on the computer, that's probably your first red flag that there might be something at play. And then the second largest red flag about any addiction that you might have is when it starts taking up more time and space than what you would like it to. Or if you start having that activity, eat up other activities that you know that you should do. So if you're going in late to work, if you're not eating, if you're not exercising anymore, you're not taking care of yourself, and this is what you want to do most and more often than anything else, then you probably are dealing with an addiction. And it's something that you know, any anything that you do in your brain, the connections become stronger. You, like, how do you get better at something? You practice. So the more that you practice being addicted to some, something, the stronger that addiction is going to happen. So the earlier that you catch it, the easier it will be to undo that feeling of like that high do- dopamine res- response that you get when you really enjoy something. All right. Well, Georgia, thank you so much. Georgia Dow is a senior editor at iMore. And tell us about the podcasts that you do also. Um, I do Vector. It's a podcast of like culture and technology. And I also am sometimes on the iMore show. And that one's just about all Apple news that happens to be coming our way. And also Isometric, which is a gaming podcast. Well, thank you so much. And Georgia is on Twitter at Georgia underscore Dow. And uh, we would love to have you on again. I hope you enjoyed thank yourself. You. <laughs> I did. Thank you so much. I know much. you, I heard you say you enjoy doing podcasts. So I was very I excited to hear podcasts. that. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. Well, great. Take care. Thanks. Coming up, the Nokia comeback tour and somebody built the droid I was looking for. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Harry's. Harry's is fixing a problem most of us have, paying too much for overpriced razors. Let's admit, razors are expensive. They run about $4 a blade. A guy who shaves every day spends hundreds of dollars a year just on razors. And when we go to the store to buy them, sometimes we have to deal with these pesky locked up plexiglass cabinets. It's a huge pain. Now there's a company that's fixing all this for us. It's called Harry's. Harry's offers high quality razors at about half the price of those big brand blades. Harry's makes their razors in their own factory in Germany. They engineer them for sharpness and high performance, and they ship them free to your front doorstep. And because they make and ship their own blades in this little case, that's what it will arrive when it, that's what it'll look like when it arrives. They're a more efficient company. They can uh, give you factory direct pricing. Harry guarantees satisfaction in each kit. You get a razor with a handle that looks and feels great and uh, three razor blades and foaming shave gel. The Starter Truman set is an amazing deal. You get all of this for $15. Harry's gives you a clean, close, and comfortable shave. You will love the look and feel of the set, and you will love the price. Harry's costs half as much as those razors at the store. They also have a new aftershave moisturizer that protects and hydrates your skin. Go to harrys.com and get $5 off your first purchase with the code TN2. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Enter the code TN2, the number two, at checkout. We thank Harry's for their support of Tech News Tonight. And on to a few more stories we're following today. Sources tell Recode that former phone giant Nokia is poised to re-enter the consumer phone market. Now, Microsoft bought Nokia's mobile handset business in 2013, and part of the deal was a contract that prevented Nokia from, from selling any phones under the Nokia brand until the end of this year. Nokia sold them to Microsoft when it looked like they would never catch up to Apple or Google in the smartphone business. Recode's Ina Fried says not to expect Nokia to try to catch up now, but instead to take a new approach, possibly resembling the one that Polaroid and Kodak took after they emerged from bankruptcy. 
VentureBeat reports that you can now download your entire Google search history if you dare. Just go to history.google.com, click the settings icon, and then click download. The archive will be emailed to you as separate files, so be prepared to be embarrassed and bored, shocked, and reminded of just how much information Google has about you. Also, you might realize that now is the time to start having that conversation with your children about what they might have been searching for. And on Friday, I told you our know-how team was going to build a BB-8, the droid that stole the show at the Star Wars celebration last week. Now, Padre says he's already built part of it, but it looks like somebody beat him to the whole thing. Mashable reports that industrial designer Christian Poulsen used a Sphero, that's the toy we talked about on Friday, and a CNC machine, and the rest is Star Wars history. And finally, Android Central reports that Samsung's new theme engine for the Galaxy S6 and the Galaxy, Galaxy S6 Edge lets you start up your Android phone with any Avenger you want, except, of course, if you want one of the, the female Avengers or the one female Avenger. That's right, all the dude Avengers are listed, but there is no Black Widow. Even legendary bit player Hawkeye is there. Scarlett Johansson, Android fans, where are you? Where's your rage? Where's your fury? Where's your change.org petition? And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.